All right, everyone. So we have last chapter of the semester, chapter 26, which is on interference and diffraction. So one of the things we learned in physics 6, um, we learned about the waves, and we learned about some of the unique properties of waves. And one important property was that the waves can interfere. If you remember, we talked about how overlapping waves can go through one another right and when they overlap they can either maximize their amplitude or basically destroy each other so that's kind of what we have so think of like let's say if you have two waves like this and here's another one if you put them together kind of like if you put one on top of another like this then you basically create what we call superposition wave okay so, so basically, when you have two waves together in the same instant of time, right, we can then use this principle of superposition. What happens here is when the waves are, um, let's say, overlap such that you can see right their crests match, their trough match, that type of, you know, let's say, superposition produces one result compared to when you have waves where they overlap with their you know crest and a trough or trough and a crest something like that but in any case when when they overlap that in at that instant what we get here is we get sort of like an algebraic sum of their weight of their of their of their amplitudes so for example here is let's say each one is plus two plus two then when they put them together the resulting wave is the algebraic sum of individual waves so we get you can see right when two or more waves overlap the resultant displacement at any point at any and any at an instant is found by adding the instantaneous displacement that would be produced at the point by the individual waves if each were present alone that means in this case for example we would get a resultant that is now algebraic sum of those two and since each one is two it then amplitude of plus four in the other case if let's say this one here is two that one then becomes minus two well if you put them together they're gonna then destroy each other because plus two minus two cancel each other and you get a you know resultant wave with the amplitude of zero and that's going to be then true for mechanical waves and electromagnetic waves. So we kind of talked about that in terms of mechanical waves in physics 6. But we're going to see, right, because light is an electromagnetic wave, that is also true for that. And to understand this chapter, we need to go back and look at the light as a wave. That means ray diagram was very useful when we considered, you know, lenses and mirrors. But when you're considering this type of, you know, um, applications as we're going to cover in this chapter, you have to go back and look at a wave model of light. Because interference becomes an important part of the um, this diffraction, uh, let's say, uh, effect that we're going to be absorbing, we're going to be going over today. Now, let's kind of, you know, make sure that we have all of the, our basics about inter interference, you know, um, together so that we can follow let's say the new concepts of light so remember so interference usually uh, requires two, um, two sources here's let's say source one so source one um, is remember uh, wave is some kind of disturbance in a medium um, that means this is true for mechanical waves but you know electromagnetic waves technically remember they do not need a medium so they can you know propagate from a source in, in, even if, in, if it's empty space but let's say there's a source that generates a wave okay and you can see right the waves propagate in every direction and what I have here is those blue lines right those blue circles concentric circles that they, they are called wave fronts okay and they are crests of the waves that means I can kind of draw this from the source here's a crest here's a crest that means the lines, blue lines represent the crest of the waves, 
and between those blue lines right between those circles is the trough of the wave so that's why if I measure from one blue line to another one I'm basically measuring from crest to a crest and that is you know a one wavelength distance and if I find the frequency of this wave and measure the wavelength then I can find its speed right which is frequency times wavelength all right so let's assume that this is one wave that basically generates uh, or one source that generates waves like this and they're propagating outward from the from the source well next thing what we do here is we bring another source source 2 and the source 2 does the same thing which it produces its own waves and those waves then propagating outward right from the source 2 and then you can see right this entire entire region is then filled with waves 1 and waves 2 okay and what we have here is this in, in doing is you know during this entire time when those waves are moving away from their source they are also interfering with one another okay so and uh, what i can do here is i can choose let's say different points for example here's point a and this point a is such that it's exactly same distance from the source one and two so let's say if i take this to be r1 which is the distance from the source one and this is r2 distance from the source two and in this particular case for a r1 is equals to r2 they have the same distance from those uh, that point a has the same distance from source one and source two all right so then what we get here is this so you can see that in terms of then here the wave is moving such that here is a crest another crest another crest another crest so we have one two three four crests from the source one then if i go to the source two i have one crest another another and another so i have then one two three four crests from the source two that means by the time they uh, those waves from source one and source two get to the point a they both cover so or they both have four crests okay and they arrive to that point a you know having basically you know the same same shape right which is basically what we call in phase that means both of them if i put them together they're going to be sort of like on top of each other so those type of you know interference you know when you have two waves that we call them in phase right okay so in phase in phase because we assume that source one and source two vibrate exactly at the same time with exactly same wavelength and frequency so when they get to that point a they both have the same source oh, sorry same um shape of the of the wave and both of them basically you know when when you overlap them together right because both of them have let's, let's say a crest then you're going to get what we call constructive interference okay so for the position that equal distance from two sources you're always going to get a constructive interference okay so in this particular case for this you you get constructive interference now constructive interference again means that here's wave one and let's say this was wave two when they arrive there their crests match or their traps match their crest match or their trap match and if you put them together they're gonna let's say amplify the you know let's say the amplify the signal okay now one important thing that we have to see from here is this equations that we use in physics 6 was this distance for each wave is important because we take the distance r1 and r2 and generally we find the delta r which was r2 minus r1 okay so we learned this in physics 6 that if i do this r2 minus r1 this will equals to m times lambda if this is a constructive interference and what we can see from here in this particular case r2 and r1 are the same so the left side of the equation is going to give you zero and that is then equals to m times lambda now here i'm assuming that 
lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2 because they're the same, you know, they're in phase, right? They have the same frequency, they have the same wavelength. So, but R2 minus R1 equals M times lambda, or you can see, uh, since R2 minus R1 equals 0, that means M times lambda is also equals 0. But obviously it's not because there is uh, no lambda. Lambda is non-zero. But because, let's say, what we, do, what we say here is, for the equidistance, you know, equidistance position from the sources, this is when what we take this m, the coefficient, to be zero. That means this is only can be true if we take m to be zero, because lambda is not zero, so zero times lambda can give us zero. The left side is zero because r2 and r1 are the same, right side is zero because m is zero. Well, how about, well, how about let's say point B? Let's, let's look at point B. For, for point B, I have then this, right? So I have one crest, two, three, four, five, six, seven for the wave one. And R1 is the distance from the source one to point B. For source two, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sort of like that. That means it's a nine waves, you know, compared to that um, source one. And let's call this R2. All right, so let's go back to the next slide so we can see that. So you can see right from source one to point B, it's if I draw the you know a line like this, that distance is seven wavelengths. That means you have to go through seven wavelengths, right, to get to point B. The same thing if I do for the source two, that R2 here is nine wavelengths. Okay, that means the distance is longer for the wave that is traveling from source two. Okay. Then what I have here is, you can see, right, then R2 minus R1 is equal to, if you remember, right, M times lambda, okay? But what I get here is this, right? So R2 minus R1 is equal to, if I'm doing, like, let's say, 9 wavelength minus 7 wavelength, so what I get here is 2 wavelengths, okay? That means, in this case, this M here is 2, because what we get here is this 2 represents basically by how many waves or the how many wavelengths right or how many crests you can think of like let's say one wave is different from the other one and if that number is a whole number right so you know zero one two three four five then you know what you get here is you can say that they are in phase they are arrived there in phase and they reinforce each other and we got we get a constructive interference so the constructive interference that, uh, you know, that produces, you know, a new wave right over there means that they, you know, create a resultant wave that is basically uh, more amplified than individual waves. Again, what we get here is if the waves arrive at, two, at point B in phase, right, in phase, that means you can then use this equation, R2 minus R1 equals M times lambda. See, the way we can figure out if, it, if it's in phase or constructive interference is if we divide both sides by wavelength and just solve for m. So R2 minus R1 divided by lambda will give you m equals 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 if this is a constructive interference. That means we're going to get m equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 every time we get a constructive interference. Okay. Remember there was also point C. So if you go to point C, for example, then same thing I can do with uh, with these waves. See the source one, <clears throat> in this case, has to travel this distance. So R1 equals 9.75 because when it gets there, it's not getting there like, let's say, with, the, with its crest. So it's 9.75 wavelength. R2 then let's say 7.25 wavelength and what what I do here is I if I do R2 minus R1 I'm getting you know 7.25 minus 9.75 and what we get here is R2 minus R1 is the negative 2.50 wavelength All right so negative just you know 
Negative means that if I draw a sort of like some kind of axis over here, this is at the bottom, you know, a below that axis. The negative just means nothing in this particular case. But what, what we have here is this, right? See, if I divide, bo divide both sides by wavelength, then we get negative 2.5. That means this number is uh, sort of like a fraction, right? It's not 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It is 2.5, basically, or negative 2.5. That means what we have here is the equation for the, let's say, um, this particular type of you know interference, if I do then R2 minus R1 divided by wavelength, I get sort of like a half an you know uh, inter inter integral right number. So that means in this case, sorry, in this case, what we get here is two waves cancel or partially cancel each other, and we get a destructive interference. Okay, destructive interference means that they destroy each other completely or maybe partially. And the equation for the destructive interference here is R2 minus R1 equals M plus one half times lambda. Oh, sorry. Fm times one half. This lambda is not in the parenthesis. Like this. M plus one half times lambda. Because see what I have here is this. M again is equals to no, sorry so if you're looking at this particular equation right so if I if you divide r2 minus r1 over lambda so what you get here is m plus one half that means see when m here is also 0 1 2 3 that means the right side is in, inside the parenthesis right if you if you let's say you can see right if m is zero you get you know one half which is you get 0.5 in, if m is one you get one plus one half so you get 1.5 if m is two you get two plus one half so it becomes 2.5 then 3.5 and thing like that that means the right side of this equation is never going to be um, you know like an integer so it's always going to be 0.5 1.5 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, and so on and so forth. That is a constructive, uh, sorry, destructive interference. Remember, for constructive interference, if you're doing this ratio, you're going to get one, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, always. The right side is always going to be uh, basically an integer like that. All right, so here, as you can see, sort of like a picture of um, two waves that interfere. And you can see right there, constructive interference, right? So these are the constructive where you have a crest and a crest. And this is a destructive when you have a crest and a trough. You can see right crest of this one wave. Oh, I'm sorry, here. So the crest of one wave overlap with the trough of the another one. And then what you get here is a destructive interference. All right, so this is a little bit of animation. So you can see right, here's one wave. Here's blue another one. See when they crest on a crest, you, the, the black is the superimposed wave. <coughs> Excuse me, but they when they are crest and a trough, you see they destroy each other. That means again, you know, trough and a trough, constructive interference. But crest and a trough, destructive interference. All right. Now the same thing also happens for the um, light as well. So that means uh, here's an experiment where the light was. Um, let's say you have a monochromatic light so light will send through some kind of opening and this this effect is known diffraction which we're gonna see uh, let's say here you have parallel rays moving through some kind of openings and you can see right as, as they go through the opening they spread out like this and then you can have like a cylindrical wave front and after that when you have the light going through uh, two more openings right then you see a some you know experimental result that completely contradicts what Isaac Newton proposed for the light to be. So Isaac Newton basically did an experiment where he had uh, openings like this, let's say, and he had a screen, and he had a light moving through those openings. But what he noticed is, as the light moved through those openings, you get two bright spots, just like 
let's say if you shoot a bullet right through those openings you get two spots right so the light basically will give you two bright spots so he concluded that light pretty much moving like a particle and hitting those you know those two spots on the screen okay well he proposed that light is a particle and because it's Isaac Newton everybody followed that light is a particle we had to wait um, you know a century or so until Thomas Young in I think 1801 did an experiment and we're gonna see his experiment where he did roughly the same thing the only thing here is that the openings that he had were much smaller than the openings that Isaac Newton used okay so this slits slit one and slit two much smaller and the openings are basically so uh, let's say we you know we take the size of openings right kind of comparable to the wavelength of light and if that's true if you can make those openings relatively small then when the light spreads out from the other side so instead of let's say those two let's say instead of those two bright spots what Thomas Young observed is this as the light goes through the opening much smaller openings then there's one bright spot right here then another, another one there's another one there's another one there's another one so you get a pattern like that and there is no way this can you know work if the light was a particle see if it moves as a particle it hits the screen it should be two small two small bright spots but it's not it's one central bright spot then there is a dark spot there's a bright spot dark spot bright spot and it kind of continues like this so it's going to continue and you're going to get like you know a bunch of bright and dark spots so basically like over here on the screen well that because the light doesn't go you know as a particle it basically travels as a wave after it goes through those two slits and what we get here is basically <clears throat> interference of those waves so what we get here is the waves as they move through those openings right as they move through those openings they spread out like this like let's say this way you know wave one and then what you get here is then here's a second wave and here's a second wave and then when those wave overlap on the screen well they create constructive interference and destructive interference right just we talked about and those constructive and destructive interferences then give you a bright spot and a dark spot we call it like fringes so dark fringe or we can call it bands also and those are you know can only explain if you assume uh, let's say if the light is a wave if the light is a wave then they can overlap and they can create those bands or those fringes okay if light is a particle you can never have that so that's why after this experiment there was no doubt that light was a wave and after this pretty much everybody accepted that light is a wave so that's why you know when Maxwell came up with electromagnetic wave let's say a, a description and figure out that the electromagnetic wave is moving with the speed of you know three times ten to the eight meter per second in you know in vacuum he had no problem saying that okay electromagnetic wave is probably light because light we know or they knew already was a wave I mean it's hard to like put together two things when one is a wave the other one is a particle okay but when you know already that both of them are waves then maybe they can be the same thing all right so anyway so that's kind of like the idea for this uh, for this chapter that means we are looking at those type of you know interference uh, let's say of the light when it goes through the you know this two slits so this is known as a you know a double slit experiment so the Thomas Young did this double double slit experiment to demonstrate that you know light is a uh, light is a wave so this two source interference light right or two slit you know experiment uh, is pretty much uh, without doubt concluded that light is a is a wave so then we do same same thing like okay now that is if it's a wave that means it's you know it should have a wavelength it should have a frequency it should interfere with one another right then we can then basically use some of those equations that we learned to you know describe this let's say this type of patterns
All right, so if you remember, we had equations that I went over just, right? So let's say R2 minus R1 equals M times lambda. So this is for the constructive interference. And R2 minus R1 is equals to M plus one half times lambda. This is for destructive interference. All right, so this is then true for this type of experiment as well. Okay, so we're going to then dissect this double slit experiment, try to come up with equations, right, the, that can allow us to calculate some of those properties. And let's say, and we're going to use this, you know, little bit of geometry here to kind of like figure out that. So things like this. So what we do here is you can see right on the left side, those are the positions of the slits. So you have source one and source two, or slit one and slit two. And we take the distance from the center of one to the center of the other one to be D. That means D here is the distance between those slits. And what I have here is on the right side, then we have the screen. Okay, on the right side, we have the screen. And then we kind of draw a line like this that, you know, goes from the slits to the screen. Okay. Now, what I have here is next is I'm going to look at in terms of let's say if the, as the light is moving from one slit to not uh, from one slit to the screen then from another sl slit to the screen when both of those waves let's say get to this point p let's say okay here's a wave one gets there and let's say then here's a wave two gets there at that at that position p which is some distance y below this axis right that we have where we can take this to be y equals zero. So at that point P, are we going to get a constructive interference or are we going to get a destructive interference? Well, remember, it, it depends on this whole thing, right? Are they going to come there in phase or are they going to get there out of phase, right? So is, are you going to get a crest and a crest or a crest of one with a trough of another one? That's why when, when two waves get there, and we can see that they're crest and crest, we know that it's going to be, uh, let's say, a bright spot, right? Or bright, uh, bright fringe. So that means it's going to be a bright spot. If they get there and, you know, they're out of phase, then they're going to be a dark spot, right? And the dark spot generally is, let's say, here's the central one, right? Maybe there's another one like this, another one like that, where there was here another, let's say, dark spot. <laughs> that means what we're going to have here is will depend on the experimental result, right? So, anyway, so what we do here is this. So, these equations can be applied, but sometimes it's easier to use some of the, uh, let's say, quantities that are specific to this type of experiment. Remember, those can work for any two interfering waves. All right, so in this double slit experiment, what we have here is let's say all right so you can see right this is s1 which is the distance r1 so from slit 1 to p is the r1 which is the distance that wave 1 has to travel this is r2 right the distance that you know from the, the wave from the slit 2 has to travel that means we know that you know we need to do the difference r2 minus r1 but one thing we can see from the geometry is then also this. Let me kind of clean this so it will be easier for you guys to see. So one thing we can see here is this. If I kind of look at R1 and R2, I can see that if I draw this line which is perpendicular to that other wave, right? So from here to there, R1 and R2 are the same. From here to there, to the point P. That means this distance here, let me make it maybe like a red color. See, this distance here for the uh, so, uh, slit one, right? Uh, so, slit two, which is, which is wave two. So, that distance is that extra distance that this wave has to travel. Okay? Now, what I have here is since this guy here is a D, and there's this angle here, right? The angle that the, you know, this wave makes with respect to the. Um, with respect to this axis, right? So then this extra length position, right? That uh, this extra length that has to travel is nothing but, you can see, right? So we're constructing 
you know, this triangle. So this is D, this is theta, so this is the opposite, so it becomes D sine of theta. Remember, right? You know, opposite is equals to, you know, um, or opposite over hypotenuse is equals to sine of theta. So an opposite, right, is equals to then, in this case, D sine of theta. All right. So that's basically what we're doing. So a little bit of geometry and trigonometry. Okay. That means I'm saying that this this distance is the extra distance. That means when I do R2 minus R1, I'm basically calculating that distance. But that distance using the geometry is also equals to D sine of theta. All right, equals to D sine of theta. That means what we're doing here is we're basically arranging another way of writing R2 minus R1. So R2 minus R1, it's much easier to present it by D sine theta because not always we're going to get R2 and R1. But let's say if you're given D and theta, we can always basically use the, you know, this equation of D sine theta. All right, so let me clear this. Then what we have is this. So the constructive interference reinforcement occurs at a point P in a brightly illuminated region of the screen when the path difference, so this is the path difference, right, is an integral number of wavelengths. Okay. That means R2 minus R1, which is now, we assume that it can be also written as D sine theta, is now this is equals to M times lambda. If R2 minus R1, which is same as D sine theta, now it can also be then equals to the M times lambda. That means this is going to be uh, constructive interference. Okay. That means I can do that same thing, right? So I can do D sine theta over the wavelength to find the right side. And if I find 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that means what I'm getting here is I'm getting constructive interference. All right, so again, here's the equation. So constructive interference, right, reinforcement occurs at points where the path difference is an integral number of wavelengths, m times lambda. So the bright regions on the screen occur at an angles theta for which d sine of theta, where the d here is, you can see, right, distance between the slits, the sine of theta is angle of line from slit to the m right region on the screen, and this is equals to m times lambda, where m equals zero, plus minus one, plus minus two, and so on and so forth. Again, so how come we have plus minuses for the one and two? Well, one of the things we have here is thing like this. So if this is the slits, right, and this is a screen, so if I draw this line over there, so I get one central one. We're always going to get one central one because the one central one represents when I have R1 and R2 are exactly the same. Okay, it's same distance from that. But then what I can have here is there's going to be a bright one right above. So the central one is M equals zero. So there's a bright one right above. So this is M equals, so, um, well, not enough room, so let me put it like this. So M equals, let's say, plus one. And there's a one below, so M equals negative one. And there's going to be another bright spot, M equals plus two. Another one right here, m equals minus 2. That means with respect to the central axis, right, anything above it is plus, anything below that is minus. So that's right, it's plus, minus, plus, minus for all those things. All right, so similarly, a destructive interference. So for example, if I do the same thing, right, so if I look at, you know, here's R2, here's R1, but for that position P, see, over there, there's another dark spot, uh, bright spot. That means there's a dark spot over there. That means when they overlap at that point P prime, they destroy each other because they're going to be out of phase when they arrive there. Okay, so when they arrive there out of phase, they're going to then create a destructive interference or cancellation. So forming dark regions in, in on the screen at points for which the path difference is half an integral number of wavelengths. So kind of like exactly what we did. So R2 minus R1, remember, was M plus one half times lambda. But we're now replacing R2 minus R1 with D sine of theta. Okay. Again, you get the same thing because there's a dark fringes above and below, right? So you have then M plus minus, you know, M plus one half lambda and so on and so forth. So this is for the 
distractive interference. Okay, so this is for the distractive interference, where m equals 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2, and so on and so forth. Okay, now, these are then, you can think of like mathematics of this diffraction. A double slit experiment, right? So that means you get constructive interference if they are in phase and reinforce each other, or you get a distractive interference if they cancel each other and come there out of phase. So that's why you see a bunch of bright and dark, you know, spots or bands or fringes, whatever you want to call that. All right. So um, again, so we call them again fringe here, right? So this pattern on the screen in a succession is a succession of bright and dark bands, often called fringe. We can derive an expression for the position of the centers, centers of the bright bands on the screen. Okay, that means what we can do here is we have those equations, right? So where we have, um, <clears throat> let's say, equation where d sine of theta, for example, equals m times lambda, right? So in this particular case, when I'm looking at the position, in a way, I'm using this angle theta. I'm using this angle theta. And this angle theta is, you know, angular, sort of like position, right? Remember, theta here is angular position. So one of the things we're going to be able to do here is understand that whenever we're dealing with, a, you know, a bright and dark fringes in a double slit experiment, those thetas, right, are very small. And one approximation in physics that we can always make is when the theta is very small, let's say under 5 degrees or so, then sine of theta is approximately theta. Same thing with tangent of theta, approximately theta. That means sine of theta and tangent of theta approximately same, and they both of them are approximately theta. That means this equation from the previous slide that I can <clears throat> modify then in terms of d times theta equals m times lambda, All right? That means that equation can be simplified to that. That means d times theta equals m times lambda, where in this case d has to be in radians, where when you're using the first one, right, so this is in degrees. But this equation assumes that your theta angular displacement is small, so we can replace it with just d times theta. Okay, that means in this equation, right, theta here is m times lambda over d. Okay, which will give you the position of this point P, you know, in terms of the theta. So let's say you want to know what is the angle theta of that particular bright or dark spots, right? Well, you can calculate, you know, for the constructive interference, so put like C for constructive, then you can also do theta for distractive, and that's going to be m plus one half times lambda over d. So this will going to be the, the distractive, for the distractive in terms of the angular displacement in radians. All right, so one other thing we can do here is this. Let's say I don't want angular, you know, let's say angular position. I want a linear position. That means what I want to do here is I want to find this with respect to the central axis, right? How many centimeters or millimeters or meters, usually not meters, right? Let's say millimeters or centimeters is this point P here is. That means calculate or measure this Y position, right? That means the Y distance. So remember the central one, right? So you have the central line over there and I'm, we're going to use R for that. So in the case, right, in real situation, distance R to the screen is usually very much greater than the distance D between the slits, okay? So, so let's say D and R both have the same measurement of length, millimeters, centimeters, or thing like that. But usually R is much greater than R. So, uh, sorry, R is much greater than D. So it's for, for you, it should be easy to figure out which one is R, which one is D in, in, the, in the problems. R is the distance from the slit to the screen, okay? And what we get here is this. So you can see then the R here is, so this is basically R, right? So then what I can do here is I can try to then find, let me do it here. I can get rid of this. So so here's my you know slits, S1, S2, and this is basically the screen. 
So then what I have here is then this is the central line. So this is my R. Okay. And let's say I randomly choose a position. Okay, so here's this position P. So I can then do two things, right? I can measure the position of this guy using, let's say, with respect to this, what is that position in terms of this data? Okay, so in terms of this data. Or I can find the position with respect to this axis, right? So think, you can see this is the reference line where this is y equals zero. Okay, that means I can measure this vertical position y. That means in a vertical position, where is that point P? Now, you can see, right, what I have here, this is R, which is the distance from slits to the screen, and this is Y, and this is theta, and that what you have is just the right triangle where those three things are related to one another, right, uh, using the tangent of theta, right? So tangent of theta is equals to opposite over adjacent, which is R. That means what I can do here is I can write position, this y, you know, position, right, vertical position of the, you know, point P or point of interest from this equation, r times tangent of theta. Okay. So this y equals r times tangent of theta then will allow me to find that position, you know, P. That means, or maybe I want to know what will be the vertical position of the third bright spots. So let's say, for example, right, so let's say I have here's a central one, here's a second one. So remember, this is m equals zero, m equals one. Um, okay, so let's say uh, here I have the <clears throat> second bright spot above the central one. So remember, this is then going to be in terms of if I'm doing the orders, right? So this is m equals zero, this is m equals plus one, this is m equals plus two. Then let's say I want to know what is the, you know, order right what is the position vertical position of second bright fringe above the central one then I can use this equation right to calculate that uh, in this case right so I'm getting this vertical position with respect to the bright fringe okay now one of the things I can do here is remember I said that you know uh, sine of theta approximately theta well so is tangent of theta approximately theta that means I can come back to this to this equation and I can say y is equals to r times theta because tangent of theta is also approximately theta. Well, but theta here, if it's let's say if it's constructive using this equation over here, right? I also know that theta here is m times lambda over d. <clears throat> that means so let's call this first equation, right, for the constructive. Then what I can do here, I can say then, all right, so then this is for also for that constructive, right? R times theta, but theta here is m times lambda over d. That means I can have those two equations, right, combined together into one. So that means y, vertical position of that constructive interference, now I'm calculating by taking the, you know, theta, right, R times theta, by representing theta in terms of m lambda over d that means completely eliminating theta at all so what i have here is then m lambda r over d that means what i have here is you know m is the order wavelength times r is the distance from the slit to the screen d here is the distance between the slits and it's a very simple equation right that we should be able to use to find you know the vertical position you know the vertical position you can see right it relates you know several things so this is a measurement this is kind of like the fixed measurement right because we, we assume that this is this distance and never changes or we assume never changes what we have here is then that this y will change due to the order number right so m equals one two three you can see right you're gonna get different you know position y so but what we have here is this equation so let's kind of clean this up all together and you know it is right y of that m order right equals r tangent theta m and then we again combine together everything and we get y equals r times m lambda over d where m equals zero plus minus one you know and so on so that's why for example at the at the center right you get the central one 
right and this is exactly at y equals 0 because when I do y of 0 equals r times 0 lambda over d because this this is for m equals 0 right well this is 0 so I get 0 that means the central one right so the one that corresponds to this m equals 0 is exactly at basically y equals 0 position okay all right so again so this is the for the constructive interference you have the same thing for the distractive interference which is y equals r times m plus one half times lambda over d so they kind of you know they kind of go both of them together so this is distractive the one on top here is the constructive all right so let's now look look at uh, solving some problems so we have two slits spaced 0 0.455 0 0.450 millimeter apart are placed 75 centimeter from a screen what is the distance between the second and dark fringe lines of interference pattern on the screen when the slits are illuminated with the coherent light with the wavelength of 500 nanometers all right so what we have here is then you are given the slit distance right D so that's our D so you can say D is equals to 0 0.450 millimeters we are given that uh, those slits are placed 75 centimeters from the screen that's our R and what we have is that it says what is the distance between the second um, the second and the third dark lines that means we're looking at the you know distractively right dark line right interference patterns on the screen when the slits are illuminated with the coherent light coherent means that the wavelength doesn't change of the 500 nanometer wavelength that means it's 500 nanometers of the wavelength all right so now what we get here is it's a distractive interference that means we have to use this d sine of theta equals m plus one half times lambda or basically we said that then d sine d times theta can be written as m plus one half times theta uh, lambda and we also have y um, let's say equals to r times m plus one half times lambda over d so there's all you know those those are kind of related to one another remember this y m so what we're trying to find here and you know there are a number of things you can do here is when it says what is the distance between you know those two right you can do it in terms of the uh these two equations right so so technically equation one equation two so you can do either in terms of you know radiant uh, the, the the angular displacement right or you can do linear displacement equation one gives you <clears throat> position of the theta uh equation two gives you position uh, you know vertical position right linear position of those dark fringes okay so again this kind of like like this right now what i have here is i think in my slides i have the displacement in terms of the uh let's say the, the angular displacement right um so you can also do that in terms of the vertical displacement right so let's say in terms of the y but for example <clears throat> what you would do here is this so you have the second and third dark fringes right so a second and third dark lines of the interference and if you do the calculations right you should be able to kind of look look at it in terms of this okay now here we have to be a little bit careful when we're dealing with a dark fringe so here's the screen uh, sorry the slits and here's the screen so what i have here is this okay so here's the bright one right central bright one 
let's say this is R and what I get here is okay so here's this guy here's this guy here's this guy here's this guy between them then we get the dark fringes okay so remember dark fringes don't have a central one that means the first dark fringe is actually m equals zero above the central one the first dark fringe below the central one is also m equals zero this is for dark fringes then the second one is then m equals one third one m equals two and then here m equals negative one m equals negative two that means you can see right when m equals two for a dark fringe so let's say this guy here right so then technically it's first second and third dark fringe technically that means m equals two is the third dark fringe <clears throat> right so m equals two is third dark fringe so that you have to be careful see for the um for the constructive or bright fringes you have one m equals zero that means then the first one above the central m equals zero is m equals one but for the dark fringes the first dark fringe above the central bright one is m equals zero that so there are two m equals zeros one above one below the central bright fringe then the second dark fringe is basically then m equals one third dark fringe is m equals two and so on and so forth right so you kind of can hopefully you guys will be able to understand that means what we have here is this so uh, here it's asking between second and third dark fringes okay that means what I have here is you know the if I'm looking at the second dark fringe okay so second dark fringe has m equals one right because we're considering this guy over there second dark fringe how about then the third dark fringe third dark fringe then has m equals two all right hopefully you know kind of clear on that all right so then what i can do here is i can then use this equation for the number one right where I can say all right so then equation one tells me that theta for um, you know let's say this guy over here right look at let's look at this guy right theta one is equals to then one so well let me rewrite so m plus one half times lambda over d so this becomes one plus one half times lambda over d so this becomes theta one okay. that means what i have to do here is say one plus then have the wavelength 500 times 10 to the negative nine meters sorry All right, so one, one plus one half, then 500 times 10 to the negative nine meters. Then this is divided by D, which is 0. 0.45 times 10 to the, I remember this is 0. 0.45 millimeters and millimeters stands for negative three, right, meters. So if I do this calculation, what I will get here is I will get something in radians. So 1.6 six seven times ten to the negative three radians this will be my answer for that and if i then do the same thing for the theta you know third dark fringe right this becomes theta two so then this will be two plus one half then times 500 times ten to the negative nine then divide by 0.45 times 10 to the negative 3 meters okay and you can see right here I'm gonna get a larger right so because let's say I'm I'm going from in terms of from here to there then from here to there right so this is theta 1 
and this is theta 2 and here I'm getting 2.778 times 10 to the negative 3 radians so slightly bigger angular displacement all right so hopefully you guys were able to follow this again another thing we could have done here is use this guy to find the let's say linear distance right so we have exactly the same thing because we have the R right R was given to us and you know same order right uh, M is either 1 or M is 2 depending on you know, the second and third fringes okay here's another example and for this one what we have is uh, we have a coherent light with the wavelength of the 600 nanometer now passes through uh, two very narrow slits and interference patterns absorbed on a screen three meter from the slits the first order bright fringe is four is at 4.84 millimeter from the center center of the central bright fringe for what wavelength of light will the first order dark fringe be observed at this same point on the screen all right so what we have here is this so basically it tells you that you first take a you know two slits you know let's say setup you send 600 nanometer light feet, turn left onto North Pacific Avenue so you take the 600 nanometer light and send it through this you know through this setup and when you do that so let's say let me kind of give you the setup here okay so here's the screen all right so again we're told that R here is now three meters and you can see right so generally the R here is you know a meter two meters three meters so it's easy to figure out which one is the R now we have also D here right but D is technically not given to us in this problem directly but what we're told here is when I'm sending this light of 600 nanometers I'm getting the first order bright fringe remember the first order means that M equals 1 so there I'm gonna have a central one here and then this you know this guy here this guy there something like that right so the first order is M equals plus 1 right for the right fringe remember this guy here is M equals 0 that means if I measure the position of this guy over here I get 4.84 millimeters okay so that's the idea that means this is y1 and y1 is then 4.84 millimeters we're given the vertical position of that first bright fringe okay now what we have here is you know it says if you take then another wavelength and send it through this screen right through the setup then at the same position you're gonna see a first dark fringe so you want to know which wavelength should it be so that same position 4.84 millimeter is a dark fringe rather than a bright fringe okay now that means generally when they give you you know let's say a problem like this they give you okay so here's one you know let's say particular uh, wavelength sent through the slits and you get something like that okay and then we send the second one well that means they want to you they want you to use the first one to get some information that you need to use for the you know a second wave and in this case for example uh, see this is the first wave so the first wave what we have here is its position y1 equals 4.84 millimeters what we're given here is wavelength of the first one which is 600 nanometers okay and we're also given R which is 3 meters okay then this is going to be a second wave so for the second wave we know that at that position right we're going to get a dark fringe okay so we're going to get a dark fringe and means that so let's say we, we have a vertical position which is 4.84 millimeters well R is still gonna be the same for this guy but then you know lambda 2 here is unknown 
But here in my for my first wave, I also have D as unknown. Remember, I talked about that. But for the second wave, we have then D and wavelength unknown. Okay. And remember, I can relate all of those together with this equation. Y M equals um, M times lambda over D times R for the constructive and m plus one half times lambda times r divided by d for the destructive. That means I should be able to relate them with those two equations and you can see both of those equations technically require d. Okay, But using this information from the first wave I can actually get that. I can actually use this equation one to show that I know I have y, I have wavelength, I have r, I have m because remember here is m equals one I can do all that to calculate you know the the distance d for the um, for the uh, this you know distance between the slits I can take equation one and rearrange it where then d here is equals to m times lambda times r over the this y m and I can then use this to calculate the d alright so m is 1 then wavelength here is 600 times 10 to the negative 3 sorry negative 9 nanometer right meters and times the r which is 3 meters and then divide by y which is 4.84 times 10 to the negative 3 meters because it's millimeters. Alright, so if I do that, I can get D to be 3.72 times 10 to the negative 4 meters. Alright, that means I get D. Now when I come back here, this is no longer unknown. I have that. This is the value for that. And what I have here is just one unknown, which is the lambda 2. That means I can then use this, you know, same equation but you know equation two because this is for destructive interference right to find what should be the lambda when y equals 4.84 millimeter r is three meters and d here is 3.72 times 10 to the negative four okay so basically that's kind of like the idea for that all right so let's let's then kind of do this so you know, now we should be able to kind of use this equation. So, um, right, I'm kind of you know out of our room over here. So, let's kind of clear all this. So then, what we do here is the first order dark fringe. Remember, what is first order dark fringe? So, first order dark fringe then is m equals zero right so remember what we have here is this y1 for the dark fringe or let me do like ym he is equals to then um, m plus one half times lambda divided by d and times r now remember i have everything right i have r i have d i have y the only thing i don't have here is wavelength right and I'm going to be using, you know, this to calculate that. So what I have here is y y zero, because m equals zero, which gives you basically uh, zero plus one half times lambda times r over d, or this just becomes, you know, uh, one half uh, lambda r over d. And if I do this calculation, I can see that uh, what I get here is this. So if I cross multiply, I get two times, you know, uh, well, if I do the, you know, cross multiply, and then let's say just solve for the wavelength. So we'll get here is the lambda here is equal to kind of like rearrange the other way around. So two times y zero times d and divide by r. So if I do two times 4.84 times 10 to the negative 3 meters d was um, 
3.72 times 10 to the negative 4 meters and this is then divided by the R which is 3 meters so if I do that then I'm gonna get a wavelength for that second wave to be 1200 nanometers okay I have slightly different way of doing this in my slides so but I want to give you basically both ways so you guys can follow and be able to solve problems different ways because sometimes one way one way is easier for some students than the other one so you know go ahead and you see what I have on the slides and you know this is the basically the second version for that all right so let's continue the next what we have here is uh, this basically what we call diffraction right so you can see that diffraction is a effect you know that light can have right because it's a wave so here you have flies have compound eyes with thousands of miniature lenses each only about 20 micrometer in diameter due to the wave nature of light the ability of the lens to resolve fine details improves as the lens diameter d increases so each miniature lens in a fly's eye has a very poor resolution compared to those produced by human but because the lens is so small all right so we'll continue our you know exploration of the wave nature of light using this concept of diffraction which basically in effect like this so according to geometric optics when an opaque object uh, is placed between a point light source and a screen <clears throat> the shadow of the object forms a perfectly sharp line and opaque means that you know it's kind of like it cannot be penetrated so like let's say so you can see, right? You have a point so point source, and then you put you know something here, and what you have here is so there's a shadow, right, of this straight hand, uh, uh, you know, on the screen. So uh, you know this is area eliminated, but this one is dark because let's say it's screen. But that you know what one thing you will think here is this will be true, let's say um, if the light was a particle but this is not true because light is not a particle it's a wave and we don't necessarily get that so the wave natural light causes interference patterns and which which blur the edge of the shadow there's not really like a sharp divide between area of illumination and and the shadow area okay this effect is known as a diffraction okay so for example if you have a light going through some kind of opening you know predicted outcome okay so you're gonna have like a, exactly the shadow of that right it means the light gonna go only through that opening and give you the screen on the screen the just a bright spot which is you know geometrical match of that you know opening but that doesn't happen in, with with waves with light because what happens here is when it goes through that opening this is what we get you can see right again it's a diffraction pattern that means that it goes through that opening but instead of just one bright spot you get one very bright central spot and then weaker you know secondary spots this is diffraction from a single slit so we this time we're using a single slit and in this chapter I'm basically covering two things double slit and the single slit diffraction interference basically so what I have here is the light this time goes through uh, one opening and a is the size of that opening and you can see right what we get here is so sort of like actual experimental result the central one is much brighter this time around for the double slit the central one is slightly brighter than m equals one two three four five here the central one is very bright all the other bright fringes are relatively weak so one thing we can do here is then when we're considering the single slit we're only locating dark fringes because here's like sort of like experimental result so you can see right this entire region is a very central bright one and then what we have here is we have an m equals one m equals negative one those are for those dark fringes those are for the dark, first dark fringe above the central one first dark fringe below the central one so if m equals 1 m equals negative 1 and what we do here is, we, is you can see right theta equals 0 for that bright fringe right surrounded by a series of dark fringes that means we, what we do here is we ignore all the 
bright fringes, we're only looking at the dark fringes. So the first one above, second one above, third one above, or first one below, second one below, third one below. And there's a symmetry. So basically, there's a symmetry between them. That means if I draw a line like this, so this guy here has the same distance as the other one. One above, one below. So the, the central bright fringe is twice as wide as the other bright fringes. And this equation then relates position of the angular position, right, of the dark fringes, you know, in a single slit diffraction. And again, what we're doing here is we're assuming that we don't look for the bright fringes at all in a single slit, only the dark fringes. And this equation basically gives you, so let's say here's the opening, here's the screen. So let's say this is the central line. See, so like, let's say this is a, a bright one, central bright one, and it's very, you know, strong. And then after that, I have the dark here, dark over there. And then dark here, dark there, dark here, and so on and so forth. So that's why m equals 1. M equals negative 1, M equals negative 2, M equals positive 2, and so on and so forth. And if I'm looking, let's say, for this guy, then I'm looking at this theta, let's say theta M, right? Or theta 2, and so on and so forth. So that's this equation over here. It's M, you know, so technically what we're saying here is then this opening here is A, then A sine of theta is equals to M times lambda, or sine of theta equals m lambda over a. But remember, the thetas here is also very small, and for very small theta, what we have here is this equation simplifies to, you know, sine of theta is approximately theta, then theta is equals to m lambda over a, where m equals plus minus 1, plus minus 2, plus minus 3. That means we can kind of use this equation. Same way, we have the other equation, right? So you can represent the position in terms of the angular displacement or linear displacement, which is, you know, like we did for the double slit. So then you can do in terms of theta or you can do in terms of y. And what we're doing here is, again, arranging so that they are combined together. So y equals rm lambda over a. Remember, but these are for distractive, right? and or dark fringes only. Alright, so here's a kind of like the graphical way, right? So this is in terms of intensity. So you can see, right, the central one is a very high intensity. So it's m equals 0. And here's the first dark, m equals 1. First dark on the other side, m equals 2. And then the second dark, m equals 2. Uh, sorry, this one is m equals negative 1. So m equals 2, this one m equals negative 2, and so on and so forth. So you can see, right, this is the double slit. So two slit gives you something like that, where single slit gives you one above. You can see right there's a big difference between them. Okay. So the fraction minima are labeled by the integer md, plus minus one, plus minus two, d for the diffraction basically. So figure b shows the pattern formed by two na very narrow slits with a distance d between the slits. So more or less the central one sometimes can be a little bit more, you know, distinct, but more or less, you don't really lose intensity as much as you do with the single slit. All right. So, generally, what we get here is, again, problems with uh, the uh, single slit. We're always going to be solving for, um, let's say, dark fringes, right? So remember that. And the dark fringes for this, you know, particular single slit, they don't start with m equals zero like it did for the, you know, double slit. For the single slit, m equals plus 1, minus 1 for the first dark fringes. So monochromatic light from a distant source is incident on a slit 0.75 millimeter wide. And on a screen 2 meter away, the distance from the central maximum of the diffraction pattern to the first minimum is measured to be 1.35 millimeters. So you can see right, so that's in the image over there. So to calculate the wavelength of the light. All right. So what we have here is basically um, monochromatic light means that, you know, a wavelength doesn't change. 
So you're given then A here is 0 0.750 millimeters. You're given R here is 2 meters. Okay. And then we're also given that Y1, right, because it's first minimum, is equals to 1.35 millimeters. That means also given as M equals 1. All right, so calculating the wavelength, that means, you know, using this equation where y equals m times lambda divided by a. Okay, so this equation, sorry, forget r over there, right? This equation basically allows us to take, so this is, you know, general equation, then what I have here is y1 equals 1 times lambda r over a. So then rearrange it, so then lambda is equals to y1 times a divided by r. And I can then plug in everything because I have this guy here is 1.35 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. A here is 0.75 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. And then r here is equals to 2 meters. Then I calculate the wavelength, and then the wavelength will give me basically the wavelength of 506 nanometers. All right. Again, uh, you know, in my slide, I do it slightly different, different ways. So, you know, here's like a two methods, two ways you can kind of solve this problem. So you can use the either equation two or equation one. Here I use equation two over there, then you have equation one. All right, so that's it for this chapter. This is all I wanted to cover, and that's it for the class. All right, guys, you made it.